So the narrative that we've kind of observed over the last, like, I don't know, 10 years has seemingly been Hollywood kind of bending the knee to China. But I was just reading an interesting article that makes it seem like maybe that relationship is starting to sever, if not break completely. So we're going to talk about that on this segment of Stopping Socialism TV. I'm Donald Kendall, joined by Justin Haskins, editor-in-chief at StoppingSocialism.com. Uh, before we get into this topic, and I think it's a really interesting article, we'll have it linked in the show notes if you want to read it. I do have to put that call out there, as I always do, to help us get our message out there by hitting that like button, subscribing to our channel, just sharing the content. If you don't do that, no one's going to see it. That's Facebook's, the, the YouTube's, the YouTube's, the Google's. They don't want our message being sent out there, uh, so you have to help pick up the slack. It's very easy. Just hit like. Just share it. It's that easy. But yes, so I do want to talk about this. Justin, this is a topic that you and I have talked about on numerous occasions, maybe not necessarily on Stopping Socialism TV, but it's the idea of Hollywood kind of uh, crafting, tailoring their content to the Chinese audiences. Um, first off, before we get into this article, uh, wh why do you think it's kind of important for us to talk about this? I think that the Americans are used to, uh, China or they're, they're used to Americans and really the, the West too, but for the most part, America and England being sort of the dominant cultural force in the world with some minor little exceptions here or there you know, where they like German cars. Okay. Sure. But everything else who cares, right. About Germany, every, the world really does in the same way that for, for many, many centuries, the world revolved culturally around what was going on in Rome. That is true with America. Mm. It revolves around, uh, uh, LA and Hollywood in particular, our cultural centers for the most part, LA, Hollywood, uh, New York. Um, you know, some, there's obviously other, parts of America that have a lot of influence as well, but it's mostly New York, Washington, DC, and LA. And that really does shape much of what happens in the world. And then you add in some, some, uh, cultural centers in England. And that's pretty much it for the, what that's what Americans are used to. They're used to being influenced by those forces. But what's happening is the, as, as China, especially, but just the East in general, becomes increasingly more wealthy, their influence over our culture is going to become more pronounced in a way that ne has really never existed in the history of Western civilization. We've never had the East dominate our culture or heavily influence our culture in the way we've influenced their culture. Sure. And I think that is a titanic shift if that happens. It's a titanic shift that I don't think anybody in the West is really prepared for or thinks is even possible, even though when you line everything up on paper, it makes a lot of sense yeah. that it would happen. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, Hollywood and just like the, the sports world, all kind of bending a knee to China has like kind of captured the headlines of conservative media over the last, you know, again, like decade or so, whether it's LeBron James paying lip service to China or, you know, any one of these like Hollywood shows or, or movies making sure that they they don't paint China as like a, the bad guy in any of their movies or TV shows. It seems to have grabbed the the attention or at least, um, you know, uh, you know, concern, I guess, of Americans around the world. And and like what has caused this is. You know, if you go back to the 80s or 90s, you know, when American studios made movies, it was for American audiences. But as Justin was saying, as China's gotten wealthier, their middle class is growing. They have an appetite for American movies and cinema just in general. So now these studios, while they're also catering to America, yes, the second largest box office and the first largest box office, if you're counting the COVID years, is China. So to get all that money, they have to make sure that they're not uh, making China angry, right? Um, so that's kind of the context of all of this. And, you know, there, there's examples that we've talked about, whether it's like the, the Transformers movies, uh, making sure that they have parts of their movie set in China 
or the Star Wars movies making sure to have Chinese actors. And the reason for this is that China only allows a certain amount of movies to be aired in their box offices, uh, foreign made movies. There, there's like a limit. It's like between 30 and 40 movies that they allow in a year. And those are coveted spots from U.S. studios, right? So they're clamoring over each other to make sure that they can get one of those 40 spots so they can make another, you know, $500 million when they when they release a new Avengers movie or something like that. So that's the context of all of this. And uh, there's, you know, there's there's more examples of different stuff. Uh, the mo- One of the more recent ones is the Top Gun sequel. Um, the... <laughs> The main character, the Tom Cruise character, has like a Taiwan a Taiwan flag on his leather jacket in the original, but because the studio wants to make sure that they're not upsetting China, they remove that flag. So they're essentially rewriting the history of that franchise to make sure that they can get one of those coveted spots to be released in Chinese box offices. So that's kind of been the relationship over the last, I don't know, 10 years or so. But there's a new article here that I was reading uh, that I found super interesting. It was on The Hollywood Reporter, which has got their finger on the pulse of anything that has to do with uh, movie studios and, and Hollywood in general. And it is titled, From Deal Frenzy to Decoupling, Is the China Hollywood Romance Officially Over? So they go through a couple of reasons why they suspect that it is over. And a couple of the the reasons are pretty interesting. And I kind of want to like get your opinion on this, Justin, and the listeners too, if you want to leave comments in there. But it starts off with kind of the the multiple examples of how China is increasingly impossible to please. So like I said, you know, these movie studios are clamoring over each other to make sure that China is not angry with anything that they're presenting so they can get one of these coveted spots. Um, You know, make sure not to make China the villain. So there's the example of the Red Dawn remake, which you've probably already forgotten about. It was so forgettable of a movie where the movie was filmed with China as the bad guys, the invading force that the Wolverines had to pull together and fight off. Uh, But they had to change it at the last minute and have North Korea be the bad guys. So it required like six months of more filming and all these digital whatever. Um uh, put Chinese locations and and actors in your movies. I already mentioned that. Uh, don't refer to Taiwan as a country. I can refer back to John Cena's embarrassing apology video. Um, but then there's like, it's gotten even worse recently. So there's this example of a filmmaker, the director Chloe Zhao, who won Best Director Oscar for her recent movie, No Man Land. And, but then she was subsequently scrubbed in China. And the reason for this is that she has some quotes in a 2013 profile on herself that was not too China friendly, we'll say. Uh, and so here, here's the quotes. She was talking about the inspiration for her fil- first film. It says, it goes back to when I was a teenager in China, being in a place where there are lies everywhere. You felt like you were never going to be able to get out. A lot of info I received when I was younger was not true. And I become very rebellious towards my family and my background. So even though a Chinese uh, you know, national uh, won the Oscar for best director, China was not happy with this quote. And the Oscars were censored in China. And then she's basically been scrubbed from the memory uh, of, uh, you know, of China, right? And this is particularly rough for Disney because, A, they were really trying to promote the fact that she was a Chinese national because they want to be cozy with with China, right, to get more of their movies in. Uh, This director is making one of the new Marvel movies that's going to be hopefully released in China, hopefully for Disney, obviously. Uh, But because of this quote that was uncovered, this eight-year-old quote, that movie, a $200 million movie, uh, budget movie called Eternals Marvel movie might not be released in China. So they might take a bath on this. This is, this is, isn't the, you know, the, the magic of movie making so wonderful, everybody. So, you know, it's just like they're bending over backwards to placate to China. And then an eight year old quote surfaces and it potentially destroys their profit over a major Marvel movie. And there's a whole other, other bunch of things like this that is just making it seem like, it's so difficult to please China, even when you're trying. Um, but then it goes into how China has been building their own like equivalent of Hollywood. 
and they're trying to make more and more movies that they don't need to rely on American movies. Um, there is a nice little chart here in this article that I was referring to that kind of shows the, the comparison of box office numbers from China and the USA, whereas you could see the trend line is the gap is narrowing between China, which is historically number two, and the USA, which is historically number one. Obviously, 2020 is the COVID years. But if you were to just watch those trends continue, you'd see essentially China eclipse the United States. And um, so, so these are just a couple of things that are happening. Also... And I actually will give us credit for this or people like on our side of the aisle. There's an increasing awareness of Hollywood's groveling to China. Uh, we know that this has been going on for years. This has just been like a thing that's, you know, talked about in the bright parts of the world and the stopping socialism, the heartland institutes of the world have been talking about this. And also China's terrible human rights record is getting more attention, too whether it's the concentration slave camps in the, the Western portion of, of China with the, the Uyghur Muslims. And this is all kind of coming to light, and it's making it seem like Hollywood and just kind of the business world is super hypocritical, where they're going to you know boycott places like Georgia because of some voting laws, yet they're still going to do all this business in a country that like literally has slave labor. So all of this is kind of culminating into this rift between China and Hollywood, that seems like maybe this trend that we've been observing for the last 10 years is starting to fall apart. And a person uh, that you wouldn't expect to speak out on this, Judd Apatow, has this quote where he says, instead of us doing business with China and that leading to China being more free, what has happened is that China has bought our silence with their money. So... It doesn't seem like this relationship is in the, you know, is in the most healthy of situations. Uh, Justin, do you think this is just like an aberration or are we seeing a reversal in the trend of, of Hollywood kind of groveling to, to China for that sweet China money? It's hard to imagine that they're going to leave all that money on the table, you know, forever. I mean, it, it, it's hard to imagine that. On the other hand, you know, I think that there is this this clash that's going on in general between between China and and the Western world. And these kinds of issues are going to keep playing out over and over and over again because we're so intertwined, our economies, the West and the East, whether it's Hollywood or it's a whole bunch of other things, we're really intertwined. But culturally, we're totally different. And there's always been trade between the east and the western worlds like that that's always been a thing and there's always been some um you know communication that's existed between the sharing of experiences and all that sure but not in the way that we have right now i mean right now china if, if the united states decided you know what we're just gonna we don't care we're just not buying anything from china beginning tomorrow it's all over no more both the united states economy and the chinese economy would be destroyed like overnight hmm. that's what would happen we'd both be destroyed overnight and we would probably have an easier time recovering than they would because we would eventually just start buying from other people right but everything would come to a screeching halt and so it's, it's hard to imagine you know so so when you have that kind of connection between these with the cultural difference it, you're gonna have these clashes that occur and they're gonna keep occurring until someone dominates the relationship enough that they can impose their will. And historically, the West has imposed its will on the East when it comes to these kinds of things. Hmm. I mean, think about it, right? We look at it and we say, well, look at how bad it is that we make these movies. You know, we're now our Hollywood, our Hollywood, uh, you know, production companies are concerned about what's going on in China. These are American companies and they are now making movies for China. And that's, you know, that's a tr kind of a troubling trend because if that plays across a bunch of different sectors, then why does anyone care about the American consumer? And there's, 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 you know, legitimate concerns for Americans there, right? But China has been f basically forced to, where are they getting their movies? They're getting them from Hollywood that makes the movies any way that they want for forever, right? The, sure. 
you know, they don't have a great movie industry in China historically. So they've been getting our movies with our plot lines and our ideas, or they just ban them all together because they don't like our, our, our plot lines and our ideas and our culture. And you can go back hundreds of years and see this play out, you know, going all the way back to the, the opium wars with, with the British basically just steamrolling the, mm. the Chinese military and imposing its will and taking Hong Kong and all of that. I mean, this has been going on for a long, long time, this conflict. And I think it's getting to the point now, though, where the Chinese feel like after hundreds of years of being on the, the other end of this relationship, they might have more clout now than they've had in a long, long time. And they're starting to kind of throw their weight around, I think. Right. And they're saying, you know what? No, you want to do business with here? You want to do business with us? Oh, okay. Well, then you have to play by our rules. And and I think it's going to take some time to figure out whether our business, whether the, the American uh, businesses and industries are willing to sell their souls totally to China for that money. And yeah. I think that there's a conflict, an internal conflict with a lot of these people, especially in the artistic, you know, like in the movie industry or anything artistic, where they think to themselves, I don't know, I'm willing to sell out a little bit. We know that they're willing to sell out a little bit, but are they willing to totally sell out? You know, mm, I don't know. See, I mean, we're going to find out. Well, the thing is, you know, for like your for your lower scale, you know, your indie film type of filmmaker, they don't have to worry themselves about this because no. they're not getting one of those 40 spots. Right. You know, so they're only caring about American audiences. Right. It's this it's this, you know, these these big tentpole blockbuster movies. Those are the ones that are going to be affected by this. And there's a whole laundry list of of, you know, of movies that have been affected by this. And, you know, historically, American movies are, uh, you know, they've got themes of, of rugged individuals taking on the system and et cetera, et cetera. Whereas in China and the East, their movies kind of center around the, the collective, the, the concept of the collective. Right. So it's just this concern that our movies were going to start bending more culturally towards the East and away from the West. That was the concern. And there's a whole bunch of policy things that are explored in this article, which is super interesting. Um, one that maybe kicked off all of this was a deal brokered in 2012 uh, by the uh, then Vice President Joe Biden that basically opened the floodgates to this. They there was a you know there was a quota on how many movies. This deal increased the quota of U.S movies that would be imported to China from 20 a year to 34 and also increase the studio share of the ticket revenue from 13% to 25%. So this opened the floodgate of a, a bunch of deals that happened, uh, Chinese companies investing in U S companies uh, and, and really like that's where this trend that I referred to at the beginning of this video over the last 10 years had really escalated. But during the Trump years, with all of the trade war and all of that and a couple of other things that were going on, it really started to sever these ties. And a lot of these deals that were kind of kicked off in after 2012 into 2014 all kind of started to fizzle. And there's a quote here from an attorney at Paul Hastings, who regularly represents Chinese studios and talent in their Hollywood dealings, said that we've gone from a tsunami to a small trickling stream when it comes to this deal making. So what we might be seeing here is a reversal of the trend line. I am. And I'm actually kind of hoping for it because I'm a big movie buff and I don't like having to placate the, you know, communist Chinese party when it comes to, you know, our star Wars movies and stuff. So it's an interesting trend. I'm not sure if it's just like a temporary aberration or if this is kind of a long, uh, you know, indicative of a longer trend. I am not sure, but I find it infinitely interesting. Yeah. I think, I think one of the things that I also think is really fascinating about this is that, you know, the standard sort of libertarian uh, approach to these kinds of uh, to, to anything really is that, you know, the market, the market wins always, the market will play itself out for the better. And we're always better off with, you know, a freer market, right? But what what is interesting is as we've had globalization, increasing amounts of globalization, and as these 
markets have become more powerful in these, especially China really is the, the big one that has a, just a totally different, you know, culture, totally different ideas, totally different religious ideas. Like everything is just completely different. Um, the question then becomes, well, if we're just chasing the dollars, like if that's all we're doing and we're just doing whatever the market forces tell us to do, then we should just do whatever China wants eventually once right. they have enough wealth to sort of justify the movie industry making their movies for china then that's what they should do right yeah. that's what the market would have us do and why would anyone care about america has 300 and some odd 30 million people china has over you know has, has is gonna have billions of people okay billions by the end of the century they're gonna have billions of additional people compared to the united states more likely than not so why should hollywood or any movie industry care what americans want when we're just such a tiny fraction right now they care because we have the dollars but compared to everybody else but at some point we may not and then right. what happens right. when we don't should they just not care well and then a libertarian in response to this would say well then you know there'll still be a, a, a movie makers that make movies for americans right but they just maybe won't make movies for you know the, but they'll make a lot of movies for china but then they'll also make movies for americans because americans want movies that are different from the movies that are being made in china that's what they would argue except the problem with that is if you're a if you're a movie studio um you don't necessarily it's it costs a ton of money to make a movie it's sure. a massive massive investment and the idea that they would be making massive massive investments on multiple fronts so that they can make movies that fit with multiple cultures probably doesn't happen i mean they haven't been doing that yeah. with these other cultures that we're talking about now. Why weren't they making movies that, you know, uh, uh, proportional to the amount of wealth in XYZ country, right? Mm -hmm. Like France or whatever. Why don't we have more movies that are more directed towards France? They've got money. They watch Hollywood movies. Why don't we do that? Because there, it's cost too much money to make movies. You can't have a million different movies for a million different cultures. You have to kind of figure out what will capture the biggest audience, right? right? And you go from there. So I don't know that. So it, it is kind of a strange concept because if the market always wins, what happens if the Chinese market eventually wins? Not just on this, but on everything else. Like, then what? Then we just all are supposed to say, well, I guess China won. And they won, by the way, by being super authoritarian and all this other stuff. But I guess they won, and we should all just direct our products and services and aim them towards them because those are the biggest markets. And these corporations are all multinational, gigantic corporations. You know, who cares if they started in America? And who cares if, you know, it's it's our ingenuity that built these companies? Doesn't matter. Now we got to chase wherever the dollars are, and the dollars are in China. I mean, I'm not saying that that's wrong per se, but it it does present a gigantic problem. I mean, it really does. So I don't know how, I really would be curious to know how a purely free market type person would look at that question. Would they just say, yeah, yeah. I guess they win. So they get what they want and we don't get anything. Is that the answer to that? I mean... Yeah, you know, I don't know. And like I, I kind of mentioned the, you know, the Trump administration and, and some of the in increased kind of scrutiny of some of these deals from just Washington, D.C. was was maybe causing this rift in the first place. But it was also happening on the China side of things. They were becoming uh, a little bit more weary of the increased exposure of Chinese business interests, interests with those abroad. And they actually kind of simultaneously during the Trump years started limiting state bank financing for outbound investments so it was almost like there was uh, from both sides of this there was this drive to kind of sever this relationship a little whether it happens overnight it's not going to we're going to see this play out i just wonder if the trend line is going in the opposite direction of uh, what we've noticed in the last 10 years and if it's going to branch off into other things too other industries other entertainment industries, and I'm thinking of the NBA specifically. Um, you know, there's been a couple of things that have happened that have annoyed China, to to you know, to, to put it politely. 
Uh, specifically one of the, I think it was the Houston Rockets GM or owner or something like that tweeted out a, uh, a post that was in support of the Hong Kong protesters. And in the aftermath of that one tweet by one guy, that's not even a player, China like banned the NBA for like a week, like it was censored. So, uh, you know, they're probably not too happy with just like some of these messages of Liberty kind of getting through. So, would it surprise me if they started their own, you know, uh, they really started tr trying to promote their own like basketball league and just start ignoring the NBA? I am not sure, but it's an interesting story to kind of keep an eye on. Just any last words before we kind of close out this segment? Uh, I, I think I th I think that this kind of conversation is something that people need to be thinking about a lot more because over the next few decades this is not going to get better this is going to get worse you're going to have a lot more of these kinds of these kinds of situations because china is not just going to do what americans want they have their own ideas and they know that we depend on them just as much as they depend on us economically and they're going to throw their weight around and they're going to try to bully us into being in our businesses and our industries into being more in line with their ideas and we're going to try to do the same to them in a lot of ways as we've been doing for a long time and so this is going to keep happening over and over and over again until there's some kind of clear resolution there's one clear winner really i mean it's just that's the way it is because we have incompatible I don't want to say we have incompatible cultures, but in we, we something has to give here. China either needs to become more like us or we need to become more like China. That's the way it's going to have to be. Yeah, no, it's definitely interesting. And uh, I'm going to I am like I said, I'm kind of into movies, so I'm going to keep my, you know, keep my ear close to this story. And, and we're going to talk about it more on Stopping Socialism TV as updates provide. But uh, if you do like this content, like I said, the easiest thing that you could do is hit like, you know, hit subscribe, share this stuff. If you want to see more of our stuff, uh, obviously the Stopping Socialism TV on YouTube, but you could also find us on, on StoppingSocialism.com, plus all of our contents on various social medias, whether it's Facebook Stopping Socialism or Stopping Socialism TV. We have an Instagram account. We have a Parlor account even. Justin, where can the fine people find you? Uh, Justin T. Haskins on Facebook and socialist Twitter. That's right. All right. Thank you. And we will talk to you next.